it would be all good. How many ready to get in the Word this morning? Are you? I got a long message today. I have 20 pages of notes. It's actually 18, but... Who just said no rabbit trails? Was that Doug? Oh, was that Steve? Okay. I might have a few. No. Uh, I have a message this morning entitled Galatians, the promise. So we're going to get into Galatians and the promise and what that means. Before we get started, let's pray together. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity. Lord, to be with church family. Lord, to share the word with church family. Lord, thank you for all those who are here this morning. Thank you for already the blessing that your, your presence and your spirit has been to us throughout the service. Lord, I pray that it continues to be a blessing. Let the, let the people be encouraged this morning. Let, let them leave here understanding their identity in Christ. Lord, I pray that it stays with us, that we don't just hear it and let it go, but it stays with us and we take it to our jobs and our schools, and with our family and with our friends, that we share the love of Christ all around us. Lord, we thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Over the last few weeks, uh, we have not only been examining the testimony of Saul, who is also known as the Apostle Paul, but now we're getting into the meat of why he wrote to the Galatian church. Last week, we just started to touch on the truth. If you weren't here last week, I encourage you to listen to the message online if you weren't here, we just started to touch on the truth that Jesus was revealed to Abraham and that the Gentiles, that's non-Jews. So uh, how many, uh, by raise of hands, how many here are non-Jews? <laughs> Anybody here non-Jew? Raise your hand. Go ahead. Anybody here Jewish? Raise your hand. Uh-oh. We're going we're gonna to get into it, Carol. We're going to get into it. So here's the thing. We look at Gentiles and Jews. Now, if we're looking at culturally, let's, let's talk culturally, right? There's Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles is just the word for non-Jews. So if you're not Jewish, then you're a Gentile, right? So last week, we started to touch on the fact that the Gentiles are blessed along with Abraham. This week, I want us to start in verse 11 of Galatians chapter 3 as a bit of a recap before we launch into the meat of today's sermon. So, Galatians 3.11, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ, Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So that in Christ Jesus, right, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. This is where we ended last week, and it lays out what Paul is explaining to the early church. In verse 15, he gives a real-life example of what this means and how it applies to us. It points us to the difference between the law, say the law, and the promise, say the promise. There is the law, and there is the promise. Verse 15 says this. To give a human example, brother, so this is an everyday example. Even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now. I don't want us to become lost in the language, so let me break it down for you this way. The human example we have is that of a man-made covenant, or what we would refer to as a contract. How many ever had to make a contract before? Anybody have to do a contract before? If you're married, how many know you did a contract? Right? There's a marriage contract. How many know if you're married, you should be in covenant with your, with your spouse? Amen? Oh, boy. The only difference in reference here is what we see as a contract versus what Paul is referring to as a covenant. Now, when we think of contracts today, for the most part, we see them as something solid, right? For the most part, I would hope so. Steve, you work with contracts a lot or no? You do some, right? Are they solid for the most part? Can, you, can, can anybody find a way to wiggle out of them? You can get you. Yeah, I bet you can find a lawyer and try to 
to, to find a loophole and to try to do what you're going to do, right? So because the thing is this, how many know in our modern society, it seems we hold contracts in little regard? We really do. It seems like one of, the, one of the most famous lines, one of the most famous lines is that contracts are like hearts. They're made to be broken. Contracts are like hearts. They're made to be broken. It, this is very evident. Just look at the divorce rates in this country. Look at the divorce rates in this country, and you'll see how much we adhere to contracts and what we would call covenant. I believe a big reason divorce rates in the church are so high is because modern Christians have a really poor understanding of what covenant means. We have a really poor understanding of what covenant means. Let me say here that the mindset surrounding contracts today was entirely different from the man-made covenants we're talking about in Galatians. So uh, let me get a volunteer. Steve, come on up here. Last week I used, or two weeks ago I used John for this, but we're going to use Steve here. So there's a couple of different uh, things that we talk about when it comes to covenant, when it talks to making an agreement, okay? So one of those things would be like if I'm going to shake Steve's hand, that's a, that's a, that's a handshake contract, right? We go, all right, Steve, we're going to make a deal. We're going to do this, right? Now, in biblical times, there was different ways that they could make covenant or they could make contract. One of the things that we do, if, you're in a, if you've ever seen a marriage ceremony where they do what's called unity sand, uh, they take sand from their, from their little thing and the, the bride takes sand from her little thing and they mix it together. And the only way that that covenant can be broken is if she can get every piece of sand from it, and he can get every piece of his from it without them mixing it all, right? That's the, It's an impossibility, right? It's a covenant that can't be broken. So if I'm going to make a covenant with Steve, I might take sand out of my knapsack, and he might take sand out of his, and we're going to mix it together, and we're going to say, until I can get all my sand out and you can get all your sand out, we're in covenant together. Now, the interesting thing is this. Steve, stay there. What covenants were, were covenants make two into one. Covenants were two parties now made into one covenant. Now Steve and I are joined at the hip. How's it going? (laughs) Let's walk together, Steve. Steve, take a seat. Give him a hand. When two parties make a covenant in the Bible, they are joined together. They are identified with each other. The Bible says they may exchange coats. They may have a commemorative meal together. They may erect a long-lasting memorial to the promise, right? We see this in Genesis. And in every covenant's core, there is a change. Listen to this. At every covenant's core, there is a change in relationship. At every covenant's core. If you're married, you understand what I'm talking about here. If you have a spouse this morning, you look. go ahead and look at your spouse. If you have a spouse this morning, you've gone from two to one. You've gone from two to one. There's an interesting dynamic of the husband and wife relationship. This is a bit of a rabbit trail, but this is worth it. When a husband and wife are together intimately, physically, you know what I'm saying? When a husband and wife are together, there's a chemical reaction in the brain called dopamine. It gets released, both by you and by them. And when that's released, you can the, the, the psychology and the, the neurophysiology behind it is incredible, that you almost have one mind. Why? Because the two have become one. This is why sex before marriage is forbidden in the Bible. If you think about sex before marriage and you go, well, yeah, I don't see the big deal. It's because you're combining two into one before you should be. That's why the Bible's very clear on it. You say, well, well, yeah, but I mean, you know, culture tells us it's no big deal now. Culture's wrong. Bible's right. Amen? Culture's wrong. The Bible's right. Why? Because we become intertwined with people that aren't our spouses. We become intertwined, entangled. That's an interesting word for it. 
with people that aren't going to be our spouses. And now there's pieces of them and pieces of you ripped apart when there's a breakup. What else? What, what else? Uh, how are covenants different? Covenants involve promises. Covenants involve families and bloodlines. David made a covenant with his friend Jonathan, but after Jonathan died, listen to this, he still cared for Jonathan's relative, Mephibosheth. That's a cool name. If, you, if, if you're uh, going to have a baby and you want to name him something cool, Mephibosheth is right there. This is a big one. Covenants are spiritually charged. Covenants are spiritually charged. When Jacob and Laban agreed to keep peace, they don't say, I'll do this and you do that, okay? I'll do this and you do that. They call God as a witness. I mean, when you get married, you call God as a witness, right? David and Jonathan call God as a witness. Covenants are taken seriously and for good reason because they're joined together. Listen, if you're only joined together based on words, those words can be easily broken. But if you're joined together based on God as my witness, now there's some strength behind it, right? Now there's, now there's something behind it. They trust a divine being to hold them accountable. Number five, covenants are not easily broken. Contracts are easily broken. Contracts, you get a good lawyer, find a loophole, contract done. Covenants are not easily broken. The people making covenants often would slaughter animals to demonstrate what should happen to the one who breaks the covenant. Uh Uh-oh. What if we did that today? Oh, Steve, uh, you're going to come and tile my field, right? Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and kill this goat here. Because that was covenant. We're making an agreement. We're going to come into uh, agreement together, right? And now they would slaughter an animal. And the blood would come out and they'd say, this is what will happen to the one who breaks the covenant. To break a covenant was a serious thing. Jonathan called on God to kill him if he does not alert David of danger. When Saul breaks covenant, his forefathers swore to the Gibeonites. Listen to this. God punished Israel with three years of famine because Saul broke covenant. Are we, are we clear on how serious covenant is? Are we clear on why the marriage covenant is so important? Are we clear on that? Paul is speaking to the Galatians about covenant, this covenant made between God and Abraham. There's a covenant made between God and Abraham, and 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 it's found in Genesis 22. So without preaching through all of that specifically, let me just give you the bullet points or the cliff notes, if you will. Abraham is tested in his faith by by a direction to sacrifice his son Isaac. You guys know the story. It's pretty, pretty famous, right? He sets up the sacrifice. The Lord stops him from sacrificing his son provides a ram for the sacrifice, and all is well, right? Shortly after that, the Lord speaks again. Now, in this version, we see the words, uh, go to Genesis twenty-two sixteen. It says this, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. So he's speaking to Abraham there. Uh, in this version, we see the words, the angel of the Lord. An angel is capitalized a lot of times in the verse before it. Uh, All indications theologically point to this being what's called a Christophany. Say Christophany. It's an interesting word. It's Jesus speaking in the Old Testament. Jesus speaking in the Old Testament. So that first verse in, in verse 16, go back one, says this. This is the angel of the Lord, capital A. So we see this as Jesus speaking by myself. That's Jesus. By myself. I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. Keep going. I will surely bless you. Say bless you. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. Keep going. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This is the covenant God makes to Abraham. 
God makes this covenant, and now Paul is talking about this covenant, this covenant in Genesis. He's talking about it with the Galatians. Galatians 3, verse 16 through 18 says this. Now the promises were made to Abraham and his offspring. But notice, Paul says, it does not say offsprings, referring to many, but offspring referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. When God made the covenant with Abraham in Genesis 22, he is referring to Jesus. And so you say, well, wait a second. What does this mean? Verse 17. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years after the Abrahamic covenant. 430 years. Abraham makes a covenant with God. 430 years later, Mikey, there's the law. It does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. Verse 18, for if the inheritance comes by the law, it no, no, no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. What we see here is now a clear difference between the law and the promise. The law came 430 years after the promise. There was a purpose in the law. We're going we're to get into the purpose of the law. It wasn't a part of the original promise. If we think about it in terms of a contract, it would be this. Steve and I make a contract. Then 40 years later, I'm going to add something to that contract and say, yep, no, no, that's part of the original. That's not how it works, right? You can't just add to it. Well, here, the law was added 430 years later. 430 years later, there was an addendum put on the promise. But that addendum does not take away from the original promise. Amen? The promise wasn't made for all of Abraham's offspring. Let's say it that way. But it was made to his offspring, which is Christ. It wasn't made to all of his offsprings. It was made to his, his offspring, which is Jesus. So we see that the plan was in place already at the time of Abraham. Jesus coming through Mary was already in place long before Mary came into the picture. So many times in our Christian walk, we see the Old Testament and we see the New Testament. And we go, okay, there's God the Father in the Old Testament, and then Jesus showed up, and there's Jesus in the New Testament. That's not how it works. Amen? Jesus, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all three in one are present through eternity. And we cannot forget that. So the question comes up with this. This is the question. We've made a contract. We've made a promise. We've made a covenant. Why the law? Why 430 years later do we have the law? Here, Paul addresses this in verse 19. Why then the law? Good question. It was added because of transgressions. Say transgressions. Until the offspring, say that's Jesus, should come to whom the promise has been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture in prison, say in prison. This is really important. The scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The answer to the question, why the law, was because the people of God needed something to keep them in line until the promise comes. How many know what it means to keep you in line? Anybody have kids? You ever have to keep them in line? Gary, do you ever have to keep Bobby in line? Did you ever try to keep Jenny in line? <laughs> a few more times is what he said there. Uh, how, many, how many have kids, right? And they ever, you keep them in line sometimes. Eli, keep you in line. No, it doesn't work that way. Usually he just laughs. But how many were kids once? All of us, right? How many need to be kept in line? A lot. Who said never? Louise, never. The perfect child. 
the law was kept, was brought on to keep people in line. The law was brought on to keep the Jews in line until the promise came. That's why the law, because of transgressions. I like what Luther said here. Luther said, the law will drive you to despair. But when it does, drive a little further right into the arms of Jesus. The law will drive you to despair. But when it does, drive a little further right into the arms of Jesus. I want to say it this way. The law brings bondage. Jesus brings freedom. The law brings imprisonment. Jesus offers breaking free from sin. The law puts rules in place for holy living. The promise gives righteousness to your soul. Those who believe in Jesus are now breaking free from the prison of the law. I'm always amazed at the well-meaning, well-intentioned Christians who continually call people back to the law. I'm always amazed at the well, and I want to say it clearly, well-meaning, well-intentioned, but off base. And they are saying, if you don't, if you don't obey the law, you're not truly a Christian. That is a lie. That is the enemy trying to put shackles back on you. When the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ, has taken them off of you. Amen. Now, before faith came. Verse 23, we were held captive under the law. I don't want to be held captive any longer, right? I don't want to be imprisoned any longer. It says imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian, say guardian, until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. And now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. What Paul is speaking about here is getting into the real meat of what is in Galatians. And it has to do with our identity in Jesus. Verse 27 says this, For as many of you were baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. Now there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male. There is no female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. You are heirs according to the promise. Somebody better get excited about that. You are heirs according to the promise. Under the law, there was a clear distinction. Those who are Jewish, those who are not. Under the promise, we are all considered part of Abraham's offspring. We are all considered heirs according to the promise. It leads me into what is, for me, one of the most exciting and touching and incredible truths about being a Christian. If you are in Christ, say, if you're in Christ, raise your hand this morning. If you are in Christ, you are part of the promise of Abraham. If you're in Christ, you are a part of the blessing that was spoken over him. You are heirs of Abraham and heirs of Jesus. Romans 8. Paul is speaking to the Romans. And he says this very same truth. Paul is speaking to the Roman church and he says this in verse 14. Romans 8.14 says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. If you're a man this morning, I want you to raise your hand and say, I am a son of God. If you're, if you're a man, you've given your life to Jesus, I want you to say, I am a son of God. If you're, a, if you're a woman this morning, if you've given your life to Jesus, I want you to raise your hand and say this. I want you to say, I am a daughter of God. I'm a daughter of God. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. Why? Because you have been adopted into the kingdom. And now God is referred to as Abba, Father. Braxton, how many times has little Reagan seen you and run into your arms? Many times. Grace, how many times has that happened with Ella? All the time. Eli, 
come running, jump into my arms, son. <laughs> like a child running towards their daddy and jumping into his arms. Like a child running towards their daddy and jumping into his arms. We call him Abba, Father. My daddy, God. Some of you here have had hard situations with your dads. Hard situations with your fathers in real life, in, in, in natural. The Bible says you are adopted into the kingdom. You are adopted. You are now, you, are not, you can now call upon daddy God. Like a child running into the arms of a parent. It's an interesting thing. When you're a father and your child runs into your arms, you will embrace your child. You will embrace them with joy when there's joy. And you'll be tender when it hurts. When the child runs to the daddy and says, Daddy, I'm hurt. The daddy doesn't scream at the child, right? A, a true, loving, holy daddy grabs that child and, and, and wraps him in his arms. Says, I love you. It's going to be okay. Let's, let's fix the boo-boo. Right? Why? Because that's what a daddy does. He holds you when it hurts. He, he is tender. He is merciful. And when we are his children, we are his heirs. When we are his children, we are his heirs. You say, what does that mean? It means this. We have all the rights privileges and benefits of our father when you're adopted when you're adopted into the kingdom when he is our now adoptive father we are heirs according to the promise we have all the rights privileges and benefits i was speaking with mel Screepak the other day about adoption and she shared with me this quote that i want to share with you it's a quote from a podcast, and it's pretty good. It says this. Adoption comes with, with honest realities, although it is never a measure of lesser love. In fact, it is quite the opposite. Adoption is the act of radical love, deep love, transcendent, folding in kind of love. And that's what Paul is saying here in Romans. That adoption is no less binding or is in any way limited. He's issuing language that shows us that when we become children of God, it is through invitation and by choice. And by it, we are fully and completely changed. Remember what I said about covenant? The two become one. We are fully and completely changed. In adoption, rights are given, names and natures are changed through a single act. And from that act, destinies are reoriented. Futures are secured through unbreakable love and commitment. That is what John talks about in Scripture. That's what Paul is talking about here. It is what I believe to be an act of recreation. Adoption is an act of recreation. It is changing the trajectory of lives. Taking the beauty and design of what is and recreating all that has been lost through sin. Recreation isn't a reorienting of our entire being back to how it was always supposed to be. Becoming children of God through adoption is the creator recreating and what he recreates is you and me. What we were now part of before, we are now. What we were not a part of before, we are now and that changes everything. To be adopted or grafted in to the faith of Abraham. One minister says this, the Bible shows us two different mindsets that we can have in our approach to God. We can approach him as slaves in bondage, or we can approach him as children. We can approach him as slaves in bondage, or we can approach him as children. What Paul is saying to the Galatians and what the Lord is saying to us this morning 
is that he is a father to the fatherless. And regardless of your background, regardless of your upbringing, regardless of your ancestry, regardless of your station in life, under Jesus, you are under the blessings, rights, privileges, and benefits of the Father. How many are glad to be under the benefits of the Father? How many are glad to be under the provision of the Father? How many are glad to have the rights, privileges, and benefits of the Father? I don't want to move away from verse 17 yet because many times in our Christian walk, we miss something. Verse 17 says this, and if children and heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. Man, I tell you what, the Christian walk is not an easy one. The Christian walk is not all rainbows and puppy dog tails, and we've talked about this before, right? The Christian walk involves suffering. And I know there's a lot of, again, well-intentioned, well-meaning Christians that think it's all health, wealth, and prosperity. But the Bible calls us to suffer along with Christ so that we may glory along with Christ. As we get into chapter 4 of Galatians, Paul makes a really, uh, what sounds like a strange statement, but when it's read in context, it makes a lot of sense. He says this in Galatians 4 and verse 1. He says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Now, that language is going to sound weird, but we're going to get into it. Though he is the owner of everything, Verse 2 says, but he is under guardians and managers until the date is set by his father. Now, it may sound like Paul is saying the heir is, or, or the, the child is no different from the slave, but you have to understand the context of that culture. Slaves in that time were servants of the household. They were employed and they were under guardians and managers, right? And so how many know that a child is the same way? How many know that a child is under guardians and managers? And you send your child to school, you expect they're going to be supervised, right? Nobody sends their kid to school thinking they won't be supervised, right? Heidi, when, when parents drop their kids off, do they just go, all right, let them run free? No. No, why? Because you're a guardian and, and manager over them, right? Why? Because that's what we have to do with kids. How many ever encountered a kid that's just running free? Don't you just want to trip them? Just, I mean, running all, how many a kid running all over Walmart? Joan, you ever see this? Right? Just screaming, running free, just, oh, sorry, little buddy, let me help you up. Why? Because we need supervision. We need care until the appointed time. When we have correct supervision, we have correct guardianship, the appointed time comes, the child becomes grown, and now inherits all that the father owns. When the child is grown, he inherits all that the father owns. Verse 3 says this, In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But, say but. I love this. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons, and I can say clearly, as daughters. At Christmas, we celebrate that, that God sent forth his son. But in just a couple of weeks, we're going to celebrate that he redeems those who are under the law and we receive that adoption. When we hear the same language we saw in Romans, we see it here spoken to the Galatians. And because you are sons, verse 6, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. Did I put that on there or no? No, it's in there. Go look at verse 6. Verse 7 says this, So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and I would say a daughter. And if a son or a daughter, then you are an heir through God. You are no longer a slave this morning, amen? Somebody stand up this morning. Are you, uh, nobody, go ahead and stand up this morning. Come on. How many are slaves this morning? Raise your hand. 
Oh, praise the Lord. I, I pray that's, that's a good thing. How many are sons and daughters this morning? If you're a son and daughter of the king, you are no longer a slave. You're an heir of the Lord of Lords. You are no longer a slave this morning. You are redeemed. You are made righteous. You are made glorious. And you are adopted sons and daughters of the Most High. Some of y'all need to remember this. Some of y'all need to remember this. Some of you need to understand your identity this morning. We get our identity confused, right? Let the church make it clear and let the scriptures ring true in your hearts that you are no longer slaves, but you have a father who loves you and loves you so much that while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. That while you were yet sinners, we would do well to remember this the next time the enemy tries to speak over your life. We would do well to remember that I'm a son of the king this morning. You would be well to remember that you are a daughter of the Most High. When the enemy starts to speak and says you are nothing, you can remind him I'm a child of the king. When he calls you weak, you can say that's true, but my daddy is strong and he'll kick your butt anytime. Listen, when he calls you, when he says that you are lost, you can boldly declare I was lost, but now I am found. We don't deserve it, but it's ours. Amen. We didn't do anything to earn it, but the Lord gave it anyways. Amen. Simply because he wants this. He wants to restore relationship. As a father. He wants to restore relationship with you. As a father. And that's what it's all about. You say, I didn't have a good relationship with my dad. That's all right. We got daddy God. You say, I, I, I couldn't run into my daddy's arms. That's all right. You can do it this morning. There was a song by a name. Uh, man, I can't even think of the guy's name right now. David DeMarco. And he would sing, Abba, Daddy, God. Alpha, Father, Omega. You are big enough to hold me, close enough to know me. Agape love, amazing grace, incredible mercy. You are Abba, Daddy, God, and I belong to your family. It would sing that and I would just think, man, my Abba, my Daddy, I get to run into my father's arms. This morning, we're going to take communion together. In just two weeks now, we're going to talk about the, we're going to get into the risen Christ. Amen. But this morning, we are going to remember his sacrifice with communion. Jenny, if you would come forward.